Josh Brown, what's going on with 2023's video games? You came to me and you said, I want to talk about some stuff. Dude, 2023's video game year, right? Yes. I think is either going to be the best or worst year <laughs> in gaming history. We're in, halfway through it already. Well, this is it, right? And what we've experienced so far has only backed that idea up mm. for me. We're still in flux right now, I think, because we've had a lot of really great games come out, yep. but we've already also had a lot of really high profile disasters and mm. things that haven't gone to plan. Even a game that I love, like Star Wars Jedi Survivor, mm -hmm is plagued with issues, is not where it should be, has received a lot of bad press, and rightfully so, for its performance issues and releasing in a subpar state. I had a massive rant on the What Culture Gaming podcast, which I recommend you subscribe to Definitely as well. Definitely check that out, uh, Monday's uh, wind-up yeah. episode. Um, but even Jedi Survivor, like I said, I think that kind of got lucky because it was so good, but it had this unacceptable edge to it. Mm. Obviously, Redfall didn't get as lucky, and that just got completely slated straight out of the gate. Yeah. Uh, and I just think, Taken the year so far with what's to come and what franchises are about to return, what mm. sequels are about to get, what new IP is about to debut. There is so much riding on the content that's to come that it could either be an absolute paradise for the <laughs> likes of me and you, for the games that are on the horizon, not to mm -hmm. mention the stuff that could be announced, but for a lot of franchises and even some genres, I think, it could be make or break. It could I... be a make or break year. My thing, and I, I don't know if this is a sentiment shared by people down in the comments, please let us, uh, leave us some comments about what you think of this. I, there's only so excited I can get about remakes. There's only so excited, so much excitement I can put into the return of franchises. I need new stuff. Right. And I know I've said this left, right, and center on many other videos, but there's just something about the current remake you know, um, slate that is in front of us, where even like Max Payne's getting remade. And there, I forget who put it together. I saw a tweet the other day just showing the amount of game logos of old franchises that are coming back. And I'm yeah. like, that's cool, but it's so fundamentally safe. And it's so fundamentally, you know, uh, a foregone conclusion of, as to how those things are going to play, unless you're overhauling it, which is something more like a Final Fantasy VII remake or whatever. I always think that in that regard, it's more of a, you know, like what, what's what's the problem? What are we solving? Like if it's, we're talking about old games that are not available anymore, just put them, make them available on a legacy <laughs> service. Why can't we just get like, a PlayStation legacy service, It'll give me access to a nice 4K Soul Reaver or whatever. I mean, I would take a Soul Reaver remake, but my point me is too. that you need to supplant the remake stuff with everything else. You and too. There are a lot of safe bets and big bets, like you said, but I'm curious how much the average person really loses their pants over remakes. Well, I'll tell you this, judging by the response to Resident Evil 4 and my own response <laughs> to Resident Evil 4, I think people go crazy for them, Scott mm. Tilford. You know, you look at how well remakes have done in the past, you know, Resident Evil 2 was hugely successful. Yeah, if yeah. I recall, it outsold the last proper mainline Resident Evil game. I th I'm pretty certain it outsold Resi 7 at least at launch. Okay. And I think it might have outsold Resi 8. Correct me if I'm wrong on that down <laughs> in the comments below. Uh, you look at the likes of, you know, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, mm. uh, you know, uh, the anticipation for Silent Hill, which I'm going to talk about. I think the desire is there, especially for games that, uh, for franchises that aren't necessarily around as much anymore. Like mm. Crash felt so big because we yeah. hadn't had a proper Crash game in a long, long time. So to not only have the prospect of Crash being a thing in our lives again, but having those old games remade and working out on our nostalgia receptors, I think it was a big win, but you are absolutely right that mm. this year is absolutely dominated by sequels, by remakes especially, mm -hmm. and that definitely has a drawback. I wanna mention it today because for me, a lot of the franchises that are returning or are getting updates, like I said, I think it's kind of make or break for them, and it okay. could be a major turning point in a lot of the franchises we're gonna talk about today. I mentioned Silent Hill 2. Mm -hmm. Obviously, since the cancellation of PT, um, the sentiment around that franchise has not <laughs> been good, nor has it been good surrounding Konami itself. No. I think Silent Hill 2 in particular is kind of going to prove to people, rightly or wrongly, whether Konami still have it, whether they are going to do right by that franchise, right. or whether they're going to continue to drive it into the ground, kind of like they were doing in the uh, you know late 2000s and early 2010s. Well, we said in regards to Konami that like, I mean, everyone who's playing, let's say you played games across the last 10 years, you will remember the catastrophic downfall of Konami circa 2015, um, and all the things that happened with them, the back and forth between Konami and Kojima, Hideo Kojima, and um, in regards to Metal Gear Solid 5, and them saying he couldn't attend the Game Awards that year, et cetera, et cetera. They went away for years, they tried to focus on 
sports equipment and gambling machines, pachinko, whatever. And then more recently, they've kind of gone back, kind of got back in the game a little bit and just yeah. sort of put out some t- uh, TMNT collections and um, putting out the Castlevania co- uh, collections and everything and sort of just reminding people of the IPs that they own or the different sort of avenues they want to get back into. And it's worthwhile because a lot of those properties like Silent Hill could do with a new installment. PT was the most open goal of the last 10 years and it never had anything to do. Yeah. They never had any, they didn't uh, remotely bring it back. So yeah, it's one of those things, but then it's kind of off, off cut, offset by uh, Silent Hill 2 finally being announced and people not really liking Bloober Team for it and that initial teaser for it being really weird, the facial animations being all over the place. This is what I was going to say, man, because I, I, I don't want to be cynical and I hope I'm not coming across as cynical, but <laughs> in a with a lot of these projects, it's almost, to me, kind of like a bit of a monkey paw situation. Right. You know, people have wanted Silent Hill to return for ages. People have wanted to see Silent Hill 2 specifically. Mm. They get that but it's by Bloober Team, a team that is very divisive and a lot of people don't like, and the it's the proof is in the pudding as to whether that mm. is going to be a great fit for that game. You know, I think when it comes to Silent Hill in particular, it's 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 make or break, and I keep saying that, but it's not <laughs> the only installment from that franchise we're going to get either. No. You know, at the big reveal last year, two more Silent Hill games were announced. But I've Silent said this Hilf? on the Silent Hill. I've said this on the podcast before. I have a feeling and it, it, it pains me to say that mm. I, I don't think those games are going to be the smash hits that we want because you mm. can't just turn around a ship as big as Konami overnight. And while you mentioned they have made some great strides in the video game space over the past few years, mm. they also put out eFootball. You know what I mean? <laughs> they fumbled the bag a few times now, the and I don't is, necessarily trust them to not do that with at least a couple of those Silent Hill games. My thing as well is you're bringing back franchises from, let's say, 20 years ago. You're bringing back things that had specific auteurs at the helm of the Metal Gear Solid mm-hmm. Hideo Kojima. Um, Silent Hill obviously had the Silent Hill team specifically, and I know that they are, they are bringing certain members of that team back for the remake to yep. oversee certain things. Um, but it is that question of like how authentic is it going to feel? And I feel like it depends how much you follow gaming as to whether you're aware of the wider machinations of the business realities of why we're getting so many remakes um, and the, the fact that they are such safe bets. Most of the time, the idea of going back to something is to test the waters and eventually do a new installment anyway. Yeah. Hence the Mass Effect Legendary Edition and then we're going to be getting Mass Effect 4 or whatever that game ends up being called. But there's another main installment down the way. That whole thing of trying to take what was almost lightning in a bottle 20 years ago and then just like going like, okay, people like Metal Gear, let's do another Metal Gear. Like the things that's doing the round right now is a remake of Metal Gear Solid 3 and then assumedly trying to re-release all the Metal Gears in the canonical order rather than the actual game release order and whether that pays off, but it's not overseen by Kojima. No. And assumedly it's not something he would have wanted to do. So I think that is a whole thing with tapping back into fandoms and what fandoms want or whether you can skirt by on just brand recognition. And I don't know, there's just something about the all encompassing franchise future um, across movies, TV and games that like does nothing for me whatsoever. Well, I'm going to give you a game that's <laughs> also going to do nothing for you potentially. <laughs> and that's this year's Call of Duty release because ah. similar to what you said there, you know, asking whether, is there a reason we're going to produce another game in a franchise or are we just doing it because it is a franchise mm. and that makes us money and it doesn't really matter who's directing it, doesn't really matter who's doing it, mm. just get it out, fill a gap. <laughs> give me some money in return. Mm -hmm. Uh, The case of the, as of now, unannounced um, Call of Duty 2023 game is that it's had a curious gestation period. You might remember, Scott Tilford, rumors doing the rounds from um, Jason Schreier the Mm -hmm. other year, who was just saying, like, Activision's going to take a year off. It's got this deal on the go. Call of Duty's kind of been in a weird space from a development perspective with a bunch of teams being brought on, projects being brought off. Um, Treyarch famously had to come in and save Call of Duty, uh, Black Ops Cold War at the last minute because Sledgehammer Games and Raven Software allegedly didn't get on. Mm -hmm. Um, And because of that, they were going to give Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 a two-year birth, you know, support that game for two years rather than having an annual release. Then there were reports that that's not quite true because since then Activision has decided to release an expansion pack for Modern Warfare <laughs> right, 2 okay. that was developed by Sledgehammer Games. But just a few days ago on Insider Gaming, the website headed up by Tom Henderson, mm-hmm. who's usually pretty spot on mm-hmm. with their uh, leaks and rumors, um, revealed that the next game is coming this year and that expansion pack has been turned into a full game right. called Modern Warfare 3. And <laughs> that, okay. to me, is just indicative of everything, the, the wrong approach yeah. to a sequel. And it's almost as if, and this is my conspiracy theory time, right. it's Activision themselves 
purposefully showing how bad they are. <laughs> so that, so someone pushes through the, uh, the Microsoft deal because I just don't understand the way they've treated that franchise in the past, how they think that is a good idea to kind of force something, to force a proper sequel like that mm. when it wasn't originally supposed to be a full sequel because they think that's the good thing to do. A lot of people on the Reddit threads, a lot of people in the comments sections have been pointing out that history is, history is repeating itself because mm. that's what happened with the original Modern Warfare 3. Yeah, yeah. That game's team, famously Infinity Ward, completely fell apart with a bunch of conflicts between that studio's heads, the, the heads of that studio, sorry, in Activision. They went off to form Respawn, and then what is now Sledgehammer Games, or at least some of those members, mm. had to come in, cobble together a Modern Warfare 3 and put it out. And while people still like that game, it's mm. often viewed, at least it is to me, as the beginning of the decline in it's that a lot era. Of people, like, hopped off. Absolutely, yeah. a lot of people hopped off. It was the one that was that felt more of the same, mm. and I don't understand how a Modern Warfare 3 that's coming out this year can't help but feel more of the same when we just got Modern Warfare 2 last year. That feels entirely like, because obviously how disconnected Modern Warfare 1 and 2 are from the original 1 and 2, it's not like they specifically remade all of those levels, all those set pieces or whatever, like it's more the, a spiritual attempt at a continuation of Modern yeah. Warfare. So to them, if you're just being called hard business numbers, it's like, can we just slap this logo go on this other campaign that was in motion or whatever it is, story DLC stuff, yeah. or whatever, and then call it the next Modern Warfare 3 and see if it works. Kind of reminds me of what they did with Resident Evil 2 and 3, like how sort of bare bones Resident Evil 3 was. Yes. Um, and obviously you can go back into the development of the original Resident Evil, th Evil, Evil 3 and realize that it was always this sort of tagged on release after the main Resident Evil 2 back in the 90s. Um, and you can argue, or Capcom would argue, that like, well, we just did it again. Yeah. But it's always going to be the, that thing where it comes up against the price tag and how much you can charge for it and whatever. Um, I think as well, you know, right at the beginning, you mentioned uh, Jedi Survivor and the performance of stuff and whether or not, like just that idea of like what state is gaming in. I feel like a lot of people want to, this is such a complete swerve to what we were talking about. No, come on. But I want to throw in the fact that, and again, people can uh, sound off down in the comments below, whether you trust the game you're buying day one, do you buy day mm. one anymore? Um, you know, what is your acquisition model these days? Are you buying something at launch? Are you trying to get it at midnight, uh, you know, for the games that do are available at midnight? Um, or are you just waiting and mopping stuff up on Game Pass? Are you picking up the exclusives months down the line? Are you waiting for the price drops, waiting for the patches, etc. Because everybody I talk to, whether it's relatives or friends, has given up buying stuff day one. Yeah. And I feel like that's a whole other facet of, you know, trying to push for bigger games, trying to push for these big franchises. There's more riding on it than ever. Um, there's the whole exclusivity thing going on with Xbox and Redfall and Starfield later on, um, which is kind of rolled into that in terms of like expectation and everything. But I feel like the, the quality side of it, when you first mentioned that, like if all of these don't come out polished and they're not worth the money, the price tag's higher than ever, then that's a whole other thing that could just go sideways. That's what I mean about looking at the games that have come out already mm. and wondering if that's going to be indicative of the year because there are such big bets coming out later on this year. You've mm. mentioned some of them already. Starfield is huge for Bethesda and it's huge for Xbox. In my opinion, it's make or break for Bethesda. I Ooh. love Fallout 4. Right. Fallout 76 wasn't well received at all and it's been, how many years has it been since Fallout 4, their last proper single player game? You eight know, it's years, my friend. Eight years yeah. since then. When they released Fallout 4, they were practically the biggest RPG makers in the land. Yeah. Obviously we had The Witcher 3, which is vying for that throne, but they've been overshadowed mm. since then. And for me, Starfield is them either reclaiming that crown or kind of admitting that they aren't the team that they once were. And don't get me wrong, I'm optimistic about Starfield, perhaps wrongly optimistic <laughs> about Starfield, but I really want that game to be good. I loved the trailers that we saw uh, mm. previously. There were reports uh, just over the weekend or maybe last week that id Software were helping out again on the yeah, combat on the to, to refine the shooting and mm -hmm. stuff. I want that game to be great. Um, I, I'm kind of glad ultimately that it was delayed a whole year. So hopefully you want the, the bugs ironed out, mm -hmm. but judging off releases that we've already have, especially in Microsoft's camp from mm -hmm. this year, like, am I being too optimistic? Well, I, I mean, I'm setting my expectations extremely low because I want to be impressed by Starfield. So right. I'm just going in as low as possible. And that bar has been set low by, like you said, Fallout 76 and what an absolute state that game was in. Um, and I know that they passed a lot of it. They, they did a whole bunch of expansion packs for it. They added NPCs and all that kind of stuff. But for me, it was always just kind of baby steps. It was just like they tried, they attempted something to do, you know, to use that engine and try and make a whole online multiplayer Fallout experience, and it didn't work. And I know that they, that game has its fans, but overall, quote unquote, it didn't work. And so it's one of those things where I'm just like, okay, I'm now going to reset all my expectations. Those expectations that were set by the likes of Skyrim and Oblivion and everything that you did, Fallout 3, the, the insane run they were on across the 2000s. And obviously Skyrim was buggy, but at the time, it wasn't the thing that every other game was buggy. It wasn't the thing that every other launch was buggy. It was, right. it was a one-off, and it was more endearing 
and a bit charming. And the way that, not that it excused any of it. <laughs> Except for PlayStation 3 owners. Yes, too. which <laughs> the game just <laughs> ate its own save. Yeah, yeah. It was ridiculous. Um, but my point is that it was like a one-off. Whereas like yeah. now, every other game is broken. Every other game is not worth your money on day one. Um, a, a example being Redfall or whatever. And it's just one of those things where, yeah, my expectations for Bethesda are, are extremely low because then I can, hopefully then I can only be impressed by something. Um, but I feel like overall, there's something to mention in terms of like the wider framing of the industry. Like if you're as old as us and you grew up on uh, multiple systems all vying for your attention, Nintendo, Sony, Xbox, um, you know, even when uh, Sega had the Dreamcast or whatever, it's like two or three systems all vying for your attention. You look at the market share right now, taking Jedi Survivor as an example, that game sold, at least in the UK, I think it was the box charts, 82% on PS5 versus the 18% yeah. on Xbox. That's an insane percentage to, to gear more towards PlayStation. Um, and just like, like I always love a healthy industry that has the, the three main players in it. And we tend to go like, oh, Nintendo's over here and the big boy systems are over here. Um, but obviously the reality of that, like Phil Spencer said in the Kind of Funny interview, is that they are in third place and they will never catch up. These are like Spencer's own words. Not that exactly, but he was saying like, you know, that they are too far behind and Starfield's not going to be the game that makes you sell your system to play it. Yeah. But just for me, the, the terrain of the industry has either irrevocably changed or is changing um, where it, we're going into service futures and things like that and the exclusives matter less and the day one performance matters less. It's more boring, Josh. You kind of answered my question, but I was going to ask you, judging off Phil Spencer's comments there mm. and what we were just talking about Starfield, like we know what Starfield means to Bethesda, yeah. but what do you think that it means to Microsoft? And I don't mean what Phil has said there about like how he views it. Mm. I mean, like outwardly, I think his comments made it clear that we have kind of different views on the outside versus the inside yeah. as to how this Bethesda acquisition has, you know, changed the perception of Microsoft. To me, Starfield is Xbox's biggest game oh, of by far, yeah. the uh, year, if not this part of the generation. I know so many friends who are kind of into gaming who want the next Bethesda game mm -hmm. and will buy an Xbox for it if it's good. Right. I think there's a lot riding on it, especially after Redfall, you know, going into the next part of the year. Obviously, Microsoft's conference is in June, mm -hmm. so we'll find out more about their roadmap then. But mm -hmm. apart from Starfield, they've only really got Forza, which is coming well, out this year. That's on that big AAA level. Yeah. That is a potentially a system seller. Which, like, Spencer's whole thing is that that's not the model they care about anymore. Yeah, like, yeah. The thing is, I, I like what he's getting at. I like the idea of empowering creators. If you watch the, the latest Double Fine documentary, uh, Psycho Odyssey, about the making of Psychonauts 2 and how under that team was about to be before they got rescued by Xbox and the project managed to get finished and over the finish line and everything, I like the idea of a monthly turnaround model that allows for the most creative ideas in the industry to get their games out. And they don't need to be really big, over-the-top, you know, God of War-sized games that can be smaller experiences experiences that are designed to be finished, like a Hi-Fi Rush. Hi-Fi mm. Rush is perfect in terms of the uh, the art design, the budget, the amount of time it takes to finish it. It's got some really cool, unique mechanics. Like, it's just a cool little game that we're all gonna play and get through if you have Game Pass and you end up you know, gelling with what it's putting forward. I like the idea of what Spencer is doing. It's just that they don't have the games. And the bet, the fascinating thing is that he's betting that a constant supply of hi-fi rushes is worth more or is just as is you know worth just as much as a big temple release like a Horizon, a Zelda, or a God of War. Yeah. Like that's the bet. And like they're trying to do both, where they're also saying that, hey, we, we bought all the, you know, we spent or we're spending $68 billion or whatever it is, acquiring all these different studios, and we have the next Bethesda game on there. They're trying to compete in the AAA space as well. Um, and then when it falls down, everyone goes, well, the whole model doesn't work. <laughs> and it's just like, which you can totally argue. I would say right now it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, like I barely use my Series X. Like, you know, it's one of those things. And so I'm just fascinated. I think I've always thought it was fascinating. Everything that Phil Spencer has been going for, I think is fascinating. And him citing Google and Amazon his, as his main competitors a couple of years ago, rather than Sony and Nintendo. Yeah. He just doesn't care about that old school AAA exclusive model. It's just, it's in amongst the Game Pass stuff. Yeah. But that's all he's selling you as a monthly thing. Th that is true. Obviously it is true. But... My question, I suppose, is micro for the past 10 years, it mm -hmm. seems, we've been <laughs> talking about Microsoft's roadmap. What are they doing? What's yeah. their long-term plan? And for the past few years, I think we've been concerned that we haven't seen it. They've made a lot of acquisitions. They've yeah. announced a lot of games, but we've not seen many of them. I wonder whether this year in their quasi E3, mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, press thing. conference, yeah, their yeah. showcase, for lack of a better term, referring to it as E3, I know it's around E3 time. That, yes. to me, I wonder whether that will be the moment where we actually see a proper roadmap, not just for the rest of this year, but do we see, like, 
the outer the outer world to proper footage? Do we see footage from a vow? Mm. Do we see what um, id software has been working on? Do we see Machine Games' new game? I think they're working on. Are they working on Indiana Jones? Have I made that up? I uh, know uh, that was announced ages ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do yeah, we see is. more from that? Do we see what these studios have been building in the years since they've been acquired we'll see. to yeah. supplement your star fields, to supplement your forces, mm. whether it's this year or next? Like, I think that would be a major win and would give me way more confidence in Microsoft because I don't really have much right now. I think they don't care about any of that stuff. <laughs> I think that their, honestly, I think no, that their you, bet right, yeah. is the most for your average gaming consumer person possible. It's not necessarily the people who are watching this podcast. It's not necessarily the people who would have a game conversation with their friends. It's the person who just would buy a subscription service because they have Netflix or Amazon Prime or Now TV or whatever it is, and you buy the Xbox service. No, what's on this month? I'll check, I might play some stuff. I just, it's weird, the bet that they seem to be playing. And I don't think it's the right, personally, it's not exciting to me at all. Um, even though you do get a few worthwhile things on, on the indie sphere. Um, but I think they are hoping that on a long enough timeline, um, a games as a service model is what bears fruit. That's what they've put everything into the basket for. So I agree. I mean, I would want to see like a big uh, rollout of games that would fill me with confidence and things I'm dying to play, but they are hoping that you will just assumedly check the latest Game Pass updates the way you might check the new releases portion of Netflix, as opposed to looking forward to a Netflix show seven months in advance. Hurts that. I've never done that in my life. Never. And in I this think that's what they're trying to world. do. I'm, I know I've <laughs> said this before as well, but it always is it is funny to me to see the gaming world follow the movie and TV world yeah. in terms of streaming and stuff when the movie and TV world right now in specifically streaming is imploding yes. and falling yeah. apart and Netflix is hemorrhaging money and subscribers and Disney's just announced they've lost 2 million subscribers and <laughs> every streamer is kind of scrambling to like course correct because they've spent all of this money mm. on a streaming service and a lot of them are really good but then they're kind of realizing that it's not as profitable as they want it to be and it can't be the the foundation of their business and mm -hmm. the way they thought it might become over the next few years well it's th worth throwing in here as well that spencer has said he doesn't think that the game pass portion of their bottom line will massively change there is a certain percent i think it's 15 percent of their bottom line is devoted to game pass and um, they don't think that that um, percentage will change it's just that the overall amount that that bottom line is worth might change so it's not like you know, as much as I'm saying that this feels like their best and everything that they're doing is going towards Game Pass, that's not going to be their entire Xbox business. They're going to have to do something else. Um, and like That's just the weird thing. that One of the things that came out of that kind of funny interview was um, Spencer saying that, you know, like Starfield's not going to be an 11 out of 10 game. It's not going to make you go and sell your system and buy an Xbox instead or whatever. And the, the route back to getting back in people's good graces isn't necessarily the games. You have to think bigger than that. I just think that's wrong. I just think that, <laughs> like, when have we, like, it's, it's some, I, I absolutely, like I've outlined before, I get what he's going for. I get the, put the money in as many different teams as possible and you green light the ideas. And when his time is done as the head of Xbox and he steps down, he'll be glad that he green lit that many ideas. Yeah. I totally get that's what he's going for. But I still think you need the games at the end of it. I mean, you still need something to make you play that system. I know big Phil Spencer doesn't view. Uh, Phil Spender. <laughs> Phil Spender. Big, big Phil, Phil Spender big, big doesn't Spender. necessarily think that Microsoft and Sony is his competition. Like you said, he's looking at Google, he's looking at Amazon, mm. those big tech companies. It's funny that his approach there, like you just described, is like the antithesis of Sony's approach, which is now va quickly becoming, mm. we'll have three, four, maybe five massive AAA games a year. Uh, and we're going to market the hell out of them. There's and a movie tie-in. Yeah, there's a movie tie-in. And those games, those handful of massive blockbusters, mm. those are the things that are going to sell our consoles and mm. shift our copies and really keep our brand strong. And I think there's going to be a nice middle ground somewhere, right? Because I don't really <laughs> love Sony's approach either because mm. we did the news video the other day where we talked about how that kind of cuts out variety in genres, what gets greenlit, what doesn't, hedging all your bets on safe bets and sequels and remakes mm. and all of that jazz. Um, and I just kind of, I want there to be a nice middle ground. And yeah. is that middle ground Nintendo? I don't know. Oh, well, the thing is with Sony's new model feels like the Nintendo model. You mm. you have a certain selection of characters that you just milk the living hell out of. Like it's only been in the last, when the hell was Splatoon 1? Like 2012 or 2013 or something? That was one of the only new uh, Nintendo IPs that they put a considerable amount of money in from the previous like 20 years or whatever it was. And um, we've still had the Zeldas, the Marios, the Kirbys, the Metroids since 1986 uh, or like a couple of years after that. And I feel 
feel like Sony for the longest time, and I've said this on loads of videos, look at what works and then do their version of it, whether that's VR tech or doing trophies after achievements or whatever it is. Yeah. And I feel like overall, they've t kind of taken a step back. They did their version, or they are doing their version of like the PlayStation Premium service as a contender to Xbox. Um, but again, I, on, I forget who, who broke the story. I think it was Insider Gaming, saying that Jim Ryan internally says that Game Pass isn't something to worry about. And like and they're just going to keep focusing on their big franchises, like you said. But I feel like overall, they have learned from the last 40 odd years uh, or 35 years that the Nintendo approach pays dividends. Yeah. Like if you invest in those franchises, I mean, I'd like I would like Nintendo to do more than one new IP every <laughs> couple of decades. Um, but that seems to work. And that's another thing to throw down in the comments is whether you do want that kind of future from Sony because they got by on that at the beginning with like Crash and Spyro, Final Fantasy, Metal Gear, Resident Evil. But over time, they became multi-platform. And it's like them realizing over time that actually we should lock these things down mm. um, is working for them. Like I said, they have insane market share. But I just think that's like a fascinating way to go because you have the Gran Turismo trailer coming out, yeah. which is almost more like a way of shifting Gran Turismo 7 units. Um, and like, if you look at like the, when the movie sales for Mario were happening, the entire top 10 uh, or like the top seven or whatever of the eShop chart on Nintendo was taken up with Mario games. Yeah. It, there's obviously a back and forth. Yes. Um, and so I feel like that's Sony identifying something that Nintendo knows as well. Um, and Eiji Anuma, who's like one of the, I think the director of Tears of the Kingdom, said he's up for a Zelda movie. And it's like, well, that doubly works as a way of promoting your game. And if we're just building mega franchises, <laughs> fine, but I don't know, where's the new stuff? <laughs> do we have any well, new stuff, guys? You're not, not going to like what I'm going to pivot into next, Scott Tillman, because I want to, you know, I'm, the, the title of this is, is it going to be like, you know, the, the best video gaming year that's ever existed? And I genuinely <laughs> think it could be, because we've had huge successes already. Mm. For my money, the run of Resident Evil 4 into Jedi Survivor into Tears of the Kingdom is next level. A little bit of dredge in the middle of that. A little bit of yeah. dredge in there, yeah. dead space at the start of the year. Uh, a bunch of other stuff to come. I was thinking about it playing Tears of the Kingdom last night, and I genuinely think this is going to be one of the most interesting, at least for us, mm. doing it. Yeah. Uh, game of the Year discussions <laughs> that we're, we're going to have had in literally years, because mm -hmm. I'm looking at what's on the horizon, and if those games shape up to be good, we're going to be spoiled for choice. It's going to be actually difficult to formulate a top 10, never mind potentially a top 20, with everything that's coming out. But I want to talk very quickly about Nintendo and, and Zelda because Zelda okay. has come out, huge success, lots of people like it, really, really good. They released the Mario Brothers movie at the start of the year, billion dollar Perfect smash film. hit, people loved it, made loads and loads of money, yeah. and it seems like they might finally be gearing up for a Switch 2 or at least mm. a next-gen piece of hardware. Rumors have been doing the rounds over the past few weeks again mm. about screens potentially getting made. An insider said that, you know, it is coming, though probably not until at least spring next year, but yeah. that doesn't mean we won't get an announcement this year and as someone who has recently gone back to the switch to play teaser of the kingdom and like i said in monday's podcast has had issues with it <laughs> of having gotten used to the playstation 5 and xbox series x and their power and their I'll just more technical stuff yeah. And, yeah from the technical perspective not in terms of the quality of the games or anything i'm just i want so bad a switch to i need <laughs> so bad a, a switch smooth frame to, rate, yeah. a smooth frame rate higher resolution uh, just I I need that leap up, and for me, mm. it's got to be now, right? Otherwise, if you let Microsoft and Sony hit the ground running with their next gen releases mm. this year, which is kind of what they're trying to do, you know, we've joked so many times that the next gen uh, consoles released in 2020, but the next gen era <laughs> starts in 2023. Yeah. Now I need a Switch to announcement, not one that not not a piece of hardware that can compete with those machines. Nintendo haven't been interested in that at all nope. over the past few decades, mm -hmm. but something that gives the Switch a bit of a bump and allows it to at least come be in the same conversation. This is a whole other thing as well, um, because Tears of the Kingdom has obviously done extremely well. It's sold really well. It's only been out since Friday, but I saw a statistic that it's already outsold. It was like Wind Waker, Skyward Sword, and Link Between Worlds. In its opening weekend, it's outsold those games. Right. Full lifetime sales or something. It's doing very, very well. I feel like it highlights, and again, there are various conversations doing the rounds on social media or as to how physics dependent Tears of the Kingdom is, how much fun it is from a gameplay point of view, and how much Nintendo or the general game's direction doesn't care about fidelity, doesn't care about spending that much time fleshing out the specific details of, you know, the foliage or like the way that the light works in the game or whatever. Things that you might associate with big AAA releases, like a Red Dead 2, like a Last of Us, like those really top tier, oh my god, it looks lifelike style games. That whole conversation I find fascinating because we've talked about it a few times before. And I completely, genuinely do think, or do prefer, games that focus on gameplay. I do not care about fidelity. I Part of me hates it. I, I hate the whole <laughs> push into re-rendering and rendering lifelike stuff over and over. Oh, doesn't it look like a person? I can go see people. <laughs> 
in real life. I just I just want to play the games. What cool ideas have you got in a gameplay sense? And I love that Tears of the Kingdom is blowing up so much and reminding people of the joys of interacting with physics and interacting with a set of gameplay systems yeah. that gives you authorship in those spaces in a unique way that plays into the medium. I don't need a medium that chases movies, a gaming medium that chases movies. Uh, you make a lot of sense. You make an a lot of sense. And I'm loving Tears of the Kingdom. I love its art style. Gorgeous. Mm. Absolutely. It proves that raw power doesn't mean much as long as you have a great art direction mm. and a real sense of character and personality that personality that comes through your visuals. That said, I am playing it and I'm thinking, man, I wish this wasn't this fuzzy. <laughs> man, I wish like the cutscenes weren't this low resolution. I definitely back that. Like the PC version of it, all the mods yeah. have just given us like, or people are just playing like a 4K 120 FPS version of it. Yeah. And obviously that doesn't change the art style, but it does clean it up. That would yeah. be a way better way to go. And I mean, I guess we would probably differ on the potential of the year because I think a lot of the big hitters yet to come are exactly what you've described mm. there, which might be bad for you in terms of chasing this level of fidelity, this kind of next-gen sheen. You know, Marvel Spider-Man, can't wait for. Starfield, Same. Assassin's Creed, Mirage, the Final Fantasy games that are coming out, Final Fantasy uh, 16 and Final Fantasy 7 mm. Part 2. Like, they look crisp. They I look will, magnificent. They look yeah. cinematic, but... You I'll know. only clarify my side that I only like hate that whole chasing fidelity thing if it's at the cost of gameplay. Okay. Because it's all like Red Dead 2, as much as I finished that game and it's memorable as hell. Don't do this to me. It, I'm not, I'll not go Don't too far to in on Red Dead 2. <laughs> But I'm never going to play that game ever again. It was just, it was so slow and unfun to control and whatever. They're like, it's one of those things where, and again, you can let me know down in the comments. I don't know if the average person prefers a beautiful looking game with, let's just say, less responsive or where gameplay is not as prioritized mm -hmm, versus mm -hmm. something mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. the 70s that I could still have a lot of fun with because it might look like a few pieces of ham dropped on a toaster, but at <laughs> least it plays very well. I just I always want stuff that's going to play well. I want you to prioritize that. I only have a problem with fidelity if it feels like the gameplay is suffering. I'm very much looking forward to Spider-Man 2, Final Fantasy 16, yeah. Starfield, because it feels like a mix of both. Start, can we talk about Marvel Spider-Man 2, yes. please? Because, like I said, one of my most anticipated games of the year. Loved, loved, loved the 2018 game. But I worry that might be indicative of some of the trends that you've talked about so far, that mm. it's just kind of more of the same, because we haven't seen anything from Spider-Man 2 <laughs> right <laughs> now, and probably will in Sony's upcoming conference, if it is indeed coming out this year. Mm -hmm. um, but with that, I would probably take more of the same, but I think it would be a missed opportunity if it was mm. just more of the same. And I don't know whether people agree with me here, but mm. I want to see Insomniac really push what they can do with that franchise. I, I really, really liked, almost said loved, I don't love, but I really, really liked uh, Forbidden West. But I can right. totally see people's criticisms, including yours, that it was just more of the same, but bigger. Yep. Just lots of stuff to do, uh, a little bit overwhelming, doesn't have that focus through line, didn't really push what the franchise could be, in my opinion, but we're still really, really good and really, really recommendable. I want, um, without the performance issues, I want Marvel Spider-Man 2 to be a Jedi survivor, where it takes right, what the original right. did mm -hmm. and just blows it up, expands it, cuts the stuff you didn't like, mm -hmm. and feels like a real leap in quality, a, a major kind of revolutionary, and I use that term hyperbolically, sequel, right. rather than an iterative sequel that Horizon kind of was. And if Spider-Man 2 is that major step up, mm. it would actually give me confidence for Sony's approach across the board, because I'd think, okay, use that as the blueprint now. Well, that's this the is thing. how sequels should be. When I'm mentioning, I do, oh, where's the new stuff and gameplay and whatever, my overall point is that we're yet to see something that takes full advantage of the new gen systems. There was a conversation during the rounds, I forget the specific, uh, specific outlets that wrote this up, but it was just that conversation on, you know, has the next gen Generation truly kicked in yet? Have we seen something that could fundamentally only be made on the new systems? And the, the solution, the uh, game that came out of that was kind of Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. Right, because yeah. that does load entire biomes, entire worlds in seconds. You just have to hit one of the crystals in only one of the worlds, um, and it will load the entire thing in a second. It's like, okay, that takes full advantage of the SSD that was clearly coded from the beginning to take advantage of that hardware, and it does. This Jedi Survivor, even though that's next gen exclusive, still has loading screen still has loading times like yes. still has levels that you can see where the loads are so there's loads of squeezes where i'm squeezing through parts of the environment that. i'm still waiting for something and this is like the bit where it's you know I'm, i just go like i just need to be wowed in a gameplay sense in a next gen hardware sense um, and i don't know what that is it's not really on me as the consumer or the critic or whatever the hell i am to say exactly what i want i just need them to take advantage of something and don't give me something that i already know how it's going to play that's exactly what i want with spider-man 2 yeah. I, I would i would take more of the same but i've already kind of got that with miles morales mm. Another game that I really loved, yeah, but was 
an iterative sequel to um, the original Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. With this one, with it being next-gen exclusive, I'm kind of with you. That's mm -hmm. why I think the potential is so high mm -hmm. uh, for this year because you could get those system sellers that prove what the console is capable of, these kind of next-gen systems and next-gen fidelity without the caveats of... I, I love Jedi Survivor. I'm not mm. sure if, you've know, if you know that. <laughs> I've, I've only mentioned it about 20 times in this podcast alone. Uh, but I, I want to say that I got the next-gen experience from that that you were just wanting there. Right. Uh, but I can't because I did in spurts, but it had the performance issues that, you know, next-gen games should not have. Yeah. And if that's the next-gen experience, then that is not good enough. But when it was working... In the, in the in the scale of those worlds and the density of those worlds and everything mm. that was going on, the responsiveness, that felt next gen to me and it kind of made me want whatever was next, whatever Sony's mm. first party or Xbox's first party studios can really get out of their system. Because yeah, I think, I think you're right. We've not seen that, but this year has the potential <laughs> to give us it with Final Fantasy, with Spider-Man, with Starfield. I hope they are next gen games through and through mm -hmm. and I hope they don't feel like you could probably play this on the PS4 with a few concessions. That Well, yeah, that's largely the mentality I have at the minute. Like, I thought when I played through Rift Apart at those levels, I was like, oh, okay, this is phenomenal graphically, visually, performance-wise, gameplay-wise. That stuff is, like, standing out as something that couldn't be done on the previous gen. Vast majority of stuff does feel like it could work on the previous gen, albeit at a lower frame rate or a lower resolution. Um, and, and it's just... But again, I think that's a whole, like, a consumer thing where I'm just like, what is the, what is the average consumer, what is the average gamer, whatever, want from the games they're buying? Do they want to know more of what they're getting? Are iterative of sequels better for some people because they're just like, well, it's cool. I know what I'm putting my 70 pounds into or my $70 into and they prefer that. I, I don't know. Like, I remember when Assassin's Creed Unity was shown off in like 2013 or 2012, whenever it was first shown off, there was a little bit of a gameplay demo and I remember at the time, I think it was on a Giant Bomb podcast saying, um, this is the first time we've had a generational leap where we know what the game's going to play like yeah. because in the footage, you could tell it was going to play like Assassin's Creed Black Flag at the time was like the previous one and so it's that's a weird conundrum where personally that doesn't get me that excited because I don't don't look right now. I don't look at a single gameplay system that's coming up and go. I can't wait to play that because I know how they all play. And to me, there's something fundamentally disappointing about that. But that's because we grew up in the time where the industry was finding its footing, birthing genres left, right, instead of birthing control schemes and refining itself. Like if I'd grown up in like I don't know '60s, the '70s, and watched Hollywood flesh itself out and Alien right. and Terminator and everything else, I'd probably be saying the same thing because I'd be chasing that high of the first time I saw Star Wars or whatever. Yeah. And it's, that's interesting. Like As mediums settle a little bit, the expectations have to change, but we're continually being sold new hardware and we're paying a lot for it. But it's always, then it's on the challenges on the creators to continually wow you. Maybe I'm just easily pleased, man, but... <laughs> Maybe I'm just old. <laughs> <laughs> Are we all? It could yeah. be that as well. Are we all? I Maybe I'm just easily pleased, but I, I get that all the time. Mm. Resident Evil 4. Another game that I love. I'm not sure if you noticed that either. Uh, hair strands like nobody's business. Hair strands like nobody's business. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Put them all on. On. The hair strands stay on, my friend. The hair strands stay on. Um, that was a game that I should have known exactly what it was going to be. Mm. It's a remake, one of my favorite games of all time, a game that I've played to death. Mm. And whilst it does play similar, similarly to the original Resident Evil 4 and certainly other third-person shooters, it managed to do just enough with its toolbox mm. that it felt like the freshest third-person shooter I had ever played. It managed to tweak its own blueprint mm. from 20 years ago enough that veteran Resident Evil players were surprised by what it had to mm. offer, were scared, were frightened, were tense, didn't know exactly where to go, didn't know exactly what to expect. And to me, if, if that kind of thing is the future of the industry if we don't get any mechanical revolutions because we might have exhausted mm. them all as long as we keep getting resident evil foes <laughs> either from 20 years ago or from 2023 i'm all right with that you know i really am because i was up until 3 a.m playing resident evil 4 <laughs> putting 60 hours into playing that thing six times back That's to back crazy. and i didn't expect that going in at all so right. to me resident evil 4 at this moment in time is which is crazy to say because it's a remake of an old game we all know and love, mm. um, is the high point of the year. It's it's proof that developers can still care and that they can still surprise you, even with stuff you think you're know, going to know in mm. like the back of your hand. My thing, yeah, I mean, I haven't finished Resident Evil 4, and I don't think anywhere near <laughs> as positively as you about it. I was just like, oh, this feels like a more sluggish version of the thing that I used to love <laughs> from back in the 2004. <laughs> so it was, it was fine, but I've not finished this. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things where I think overall, I'm just fascinated by the way the industry is. It's bigger than ever, there's more money riding on everything. Like you look at the deals that, you know, the like 
of Microsoft are trying to get through for the Blizzard Activision stuff, 68, 69 billion dollars just to acquire a few IPs. Like it's kind of nuts. And then in the, amongst that, Call of Duty gets singled out as like the one thing that's uncontestable. And oh my God, it's worth all the money just yeah. for that. That in itself is fascinating. And now that it's bigger than ever, and you have people watching this who did grow up with as many games as we did, um, or have varying degrees of when they came in and how many different uh, games they've played and how for how long. I'm just fascinated whether the trajectory that we're on, the the safe bet era that it feels like we're in the middle of, works because it yeah. does in raw money. But I don't know if people come away from that with as many lasting memories as they did. Maybe the first time they played Gears of War for the first time, or the first time they saw Metal Gear Solid Two, or the first time they controlled a camera in Ocarina of Time, or whatever it is. And I'm I'm relying on the hope that the new systems can come up with gameplay systems, ways of loading levels, ways of designing levels, ways of controlling something that I've never seen before. And I can't wait to control that myself. It's interesting, man, because I've been playing video games since I was in the womb, right? <laughs> I had a little, <laughs> tiny little VR controller, yeah, yeah, yeah. a little VR headset that was put on my old fetus head that yeah, yeah. was hooked up somewhere, Slimming. anyone in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I still am completely wowed by even the safest of sequels. And right. again, I don't know if it's because I'm easily pleased, but I look at some of my favorite games ever mm -hmm. and some of my favorite games from the past few years, and it is Red Dead Redemption 2. It's The Last of Us 2. Mm. It's Resident Evil 4 again. It's... Uh, That's what they should have called it. <laughs> they should have. That's Brackets the next one. Again. That's the next one. It's Resident Evil 2. Do you want it's, another one? It's yeah. God of War Ragnarok. It's obviously I've loved original IP in between them. If you're a regular listener to this podcast, you'll know how much I loved Immortality mm. last year. There's There's been a bunch of new and original experiences, Disco Elysium, that have been alongside those. Mm. But the sequel formula, whilst there's a lot of stuff that I just don't care for, and you know, you can throw in your Gotham Knights, you can throw in your know, Suicide Squads mm. with for that, there have been enough hits and enough um, creative risks and changes within what is quote unquote a safe bet franchise or series or whatever mm -hmm. that they, they're still appealing to me. I haven't felt like that's gotten narrower over the past few years for whatever reason, because every time I think I might be out, a Red Dead 2 comes and pulls me <laughs> all the way back in or a Resident Evil 4 comes and pulls me all the way back okay. in and I'm like, okay, it, as a trend, I might not like it, but there are still development studios and some publishers that do know what they're doing with mm. this stuff and can balance um, the artistry with the business desire to make $10 billion. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really well said. I think it's all going to be in the games that are coming up for the rest of the year, what, where they land on that slider as well, whether, whether you can tell uh, the safe bet side of it, the gameplay formula side of it, or whether you can tell that they forced new ideas in there or whatever. So Scott, before we finish, right, yes. I actually want to kind of sum up the year as a whole, because okay. we've touched on a lot, but there's no way we could possibly talk about every single thing about the year in video gaming, even at this point, <laughs> uh, unless we'd be here for like 10 and 100 hours. Yes. 10, 10 100 hours? You, it's you a lot of hours. Mean. It's a lot of hours, yeah. either way. Uh, so so obviously I've talked earlier about like the fact that certain genres will be make or break this year. We've got Tekken 8, yes. we've got Street Fighter 6, and we have Mortal Kombat 12 mm -hmm. about to be announced. The potential of that is huge. Yes. That could be the biggest year in fighting gaming history, potentially, or mm -hmm. at least recent history. Oh, dude, uh, totally. Or, you know, Mortal Kombat might come out with a lot of microtransactions stuffed onto it, <laughs> Tekken 6. Uh, Tekken 8 might have a terrible story and might do a Tekken 4 all over again, which I love, by the way, yes. in kind of tank it. This is what I mean about like the potential of the year. Like mm. That could be an absolutely golden trio, or it could disappoint every fighting fan on the, <laughs> on the, on the planet. Kind of like when we had the trio of Halo, Battlefield, and COD. Exactly. And it was like, oh my god, it's going to be the year of first-person shooters. And yeah. then I think one of the three emerged. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Speaking of COD, I think this year is going to be indicative of that game's uh, franchise's future. We've already mentioned the potential Modern Warfare 3 that's mm. coming out. Call of Duty generally is in, in a kind of bad place, I would argue, despite how much I enjoyed Modern Warfare 2. The fan base didn't really love it. Warzone 2 was hemorrhaging players. At least the last time I checked, the sentiment wasn't great around that franchise. Right. So I think Modern Warfare 3 is either going to continue that kind of downward trend of distrust from the fan base or might managed to salvage some of it. We've got our first look at the next era of Assassin's Creed coming yeah. this year with Assassin's Creed Mirage, which is apparently a back to basics um, Assassin's Creed game, mm -hmm. which again, is that gonna be indicative of the future? Will it instill trust into what Ubisoft is doing with that franchise? We've got hopefully the first look at Grand, uh, Grand Theft Auto 6 coming out this year. We've already had the PSVR 2 making waves in the VR space, which is really good, but nobody bought it again. <laughs> 
<laughs> one of those caveats that I mentioned earlier, we have this really interesting thing, but the fan response isn't great, and mm. it has this thing that's kind of dragging it down. The marketing was pretty bad. The marketing well. was very bad. We've got upcoming E3 style presentations from the big corporations. Mm -hmm. I just think with all of this in mind, not to mention the games I haven't mentioned, like Alan Wake 2 and all mm. of the other franchises that are returning at the end of this year, I just think, for better or worse, it's going to be a seminal gaming yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't agree. I can't disagree rather with that. There is a hell of a lot to pick from. Um, but let us know what you think down in the comments below of the state of gaming in 2023 and which games you're most looking forward to. Or if you see the other side of the coin, that we'll have to wait and see how it plays out. For now, Ivan Scott from Oculture.com. I've been Josh from Oculture.com. And we'll catch you next time. Bye bye. bye.